It seems like many prophets actually heard the same thing simultaneously a lot. In, in fact, uh, most of the prophets that existed, we don't have, we don't know, we don't know their names. There were schools of prophets. Only the prophets who are of a level enough to have words to write them down were actually documented. But there were many of other prophets. There were there were schools of prophets. Like like yeshivas were high advanced yeshivas, they would make it to prophecy. You can't, you can't make yourself a prophet. I mean, God has to be a prophet. That's correct. But as, as Ramam describes at, at great length in his introduction to um, to Mishnah. He explains there that a person can put himself in a position which is open to prophecy. He advances in his level of learning and in his level of uh, character refinement and self-refinement and self-elevation, making himself a recipient or receptacle for divine prophecy. And if Hashem decides, he gets prophecy. And it seemed like the yeshivas back then, or at least certain yeshivas, were designed to attract people who are capable of such spiritual journey. And as they would ascend, they would make it to prophecy. So just as it is, there are hundreds of millions of people learning Torah, but not all of them are remembered because not all of them actually have significant enough contribution to write to be to be writing anything down. And even if they're writing some down, not necessarily is it significant enough to be popularly consumed. That that's the truth of today's Torah study. And it seems the same thing was true of prophecy. Leading prophets that were chosen by Hashem to lead the people, their prophecies were significant enough to be written down, the prophecies were of a high enough level to have the clarity of writing it down and thus be canonized for generations to come. But it seems like there were thousands of prophets otherwise that didn't necessarily have anything written down. So in that context, I'm sure many prophets saw the same thing, just like you have many people studying Torah come to the same conclusions. Right? The only, only leading thinkers would get published and have their words written, read by millions for generations. It's still the idea in your head. Right. Um, how can you write it down at the same time? So, so you, have, you have to have the high, highest level of cognition to be able to yeah. do that. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. It's only the really significant prophets who made it to the point where they were capable of, that's right, they were able to retain that information to be able to word it and, and give proper words to what Hashem was inspired in their minds. He, he, Heard, Certain, right. Certainly, certainly. And moreover, not, not all prophecy is necessarily futuristic. Some prophecy can just be insight. You say tale of Mishle. If there's no prophecy of the future, but it's but it's, it, it's prophecy and insight. Or, or, or most notably, the description of the chariot. Right? There's no future description there. But it's a prophecy in the sense that there's, there's an enlightened vision he has. That he had the wherewithal to actually be able to write down and describe in detail. Yeah. So I'm sure others may have seen it, but didn't have the cognition to be able to put it into words, certainly not that kind of detail. So many prophets may have seen the same thing, but not necessarily do all of them have the level of being able to transmit it to transmit it to words and writing. Pathetic uh, experiences where you just start writing and you don't really know where it's coming from. They just write. So I, yeah. it may be just that they're just a, a vessel. Yeah. So the Tanya, if you look at, um, you, know, you want to give me a Tanya? I'll just read. Pass me a Tanya. I'll show you. There's a there's a line there that that kind of implies this. I'll show you. It's in um, part two of Tanya, Shara Yechud Bamuna, chapter two. He's actually um, he's actually describing creation in chapter two of Shara. In Shara Yechud he's describing creation, specifically in chapter two he's describing creation. And creation is described as God's words, right? So he gives kind of a definition. What does it mean God speaks? God said, let there be light. What, what, is, what does said mean? Uh, th th there's a mouth, a voice. So why does Torah use the metaphor of speech? There's many different reasons for why Torah uses the metaphor of speech. Elsewhere, for example, explains the metaphor of speech is because um, speech takes very little effort. And I can speak a hundred words or a million words or a thousand words and doesn't diminish my ability to speak. It's not like I, it's not like I you know, I have 
a thousand words to speak, and once I speak them, I'm done. I have the, I have the potential for infinite speech, right? So likewise, there's God's infinite potential for creation. And just because he created a vast universe, it doesn't mean now he's depleted his reservoir. That's what that's one reason for the metaphor of speech. But here goes another reason for the metaphor of speech. It says like this. Um, Although he has no bodily likeness, yet scripture itself ascribes to him anthropomorphic terms such as, and God spoke, and God said, which denote, and here's the definition, the revelation of the 22 supernal letters to the prophets and the enclosing of the letters in their intellect and comprehension in the prophet's vision, as well as in their thought and speech. As it is written, the spirit of God spoke in me and his words upon my tongue. As, is, as has been explained by the Ardisa. In other words, he's describing speech as the manifestation. In the same way that when I speak, the ideas I speak are already in my mind. Speech is just the medium by which I can manifest those ideas outside of me. So likewise, all of creation, all of the energy of creation, all of the communications to the prophets already exist within the divine. It's just a question of it being manifest within a recipient. So it's manifest in the mind of the prophet or in the speech of the prophet. So the prophet can be speaking. He has no idea what he's speaking, but it's just divine words manifest on his mouth. Or he also has an insight. He's not conscious trying to bring that insight, but the divine manifests that insight into him. And that's called speech. So it doesn't necessarily mean or it doesn't mean at all that there's a booming voice that comes out of heaven saying some words. God doesn't have a mouth. There's no, right? It's, it's just a manifest expression or manifest experience or manifest words into thought, into speech, or maybe even into writing, right? And that's why we use the metaphor of speech, not because there's a voice booming, but because just like speech is a medium by which I manifest that which I have within me, so, so is divine speech the medium by which God manifests these letters, these words, into the prophet or into his mouth or into his writing or something of that nature. And they said they were creation. Same thing with creation. All the energy of creation exists already within God. It's just manifest out into creation. Thus we use the metaphor of speech. And not because it's a booming voice that says, let there be light. That, that, that's... It's a very um, why is, corporeal why, description of God. Why are you keep saying, and it is good? Good. Well, day two, he doesn't say it's good. Yeah. But on day three, he says twice. Right? Meaning, he to say it not because he yeah. forgot, but because the day two good is concealed. Because division is created then. Separation between upper and lower waters. And that good is only manifest on day three when the earth emerges and there's potential for man to rectify the division. Right? So God saying it is good is very crucial. Because God saying it is good embeds within creation the capacity for us to reveal good. If God doesn't put those words, if God doesn't put that energy into the world of good, then we may not be able to find it. We just be stuck in a world of concealment. So when we say that God said something, he's not just patting himself on the back. When God says it's good, he's patting himself on the back. He says it's divine manifestation. So God's manifesting the goodness within creation, allowing us the ability to find it. This is not God patting himself on the back saying, oh, well done. <laughs> it's not what's happening. Hashem is manifesting within creation goodness. Otherwise, we, 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 we'd have no chance. <laughs> we'd, be, we'd be stuck in endless concealment, never able to extrapolate anything positive. Right? So whenever you have the words, whenever you see God spoke, envision this. Ideas or words are manifest within the prophet or manifest within reality. Most that's why but that's that's the word you want. That's that, that's what God speaks means. Yeah. That's why most prophets God, God is dream. Right. So some prophets can only have to go into a subconscious comest toast state. Um the the, the um it's described as a spashta sagashmi, which means like the, the, the divestment of physicality materialism. The prophets would be rolling on the floor sometimes or completely lose them sense of sense of self. Only a high prophet can be able to retain his consciousness and then get the get the prophecy without completely losing his sense of self. Back to the original point, 
that only prophets of that kind of high level can actually write down the words. Moshe Rabbeinu being the most clear of them. All right, so it, it's, it's degrees of, to what degree are you, first of all, what degree of prophecy are, are you receiving? A, B, to what degree are you capable of handling that? That's, that's a whole other question. Can, I, can you handle it a lot, at all? Right. Anyway, okay, so more, this is a nice little, uh, diver, uh, what's the word? Digression. <laughs>